and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. In our last regular episode, we talked about the life of Martin Luther, the famous Protestant reformer and the Protestant Reformation more broadly. And we talked about the formal establishment of religious tolerance in the Holy Roman Empire. But in the mid-1500s, the fire that Luther had started was now spreading throughout the Christian world, with more and more reformers starting their own movements. In addition to the Catholics and the Lutherans, there are Baptists, Calvinists, Presbyterians, Waldensians, Episcopalians, and of course our old friends, the Hussites. When Holy Roman Emperor Charles V abdicates in the year 1556 to begin what would be a very short retirement, his younger brother Frederick I, King of Hungary and Archduke of Austria, inherits all of Charles's imperial land and is elected emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. But Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, is also Charles I, King of Spain. And when he abdicates that throne, he leads his Spanish lands to his son, Philip II. This creates two separate monarchies, both run by the Habsburg family, but with different kings. From here on out, you have the German and Spanish branches of the Habsburg family, and this is a serious blow to the idea of a universal monarchy, to uniting the entire Christian world under one monarch. Kind of hard to do that when you split your own dynasty in half. Anyway... At this time, it seems as if the Spanish branch of the family has gotten a better deal. Philip's empire includes not just modern-day Spain, but the Aragonese possessions of Sicily, Sardinia, and the Kingdom of Naples, which is the southern half of the boot of Italy. The Spanish empire also includes the Duchy of Milan, which is a big chunk of northern Italy, and Overseas, it encompasses the Caribbean, Florida, Mexico, and all of South America outside of Brazil. Oh, and it includes one more territory, the Spanish Netherlands, which correspond roughly to the modern-day nations of the Netherlands and Belgium. So whenever I say Dutch in this episode, I'm talking about Belgians, too and also Luxembourg. Anyway, it is in that area that today's story begins. A generation before, the Spanish Netherlands had been 17 separate Habsburg-owned provinces within the Holy Roman Empire. Charles V himself had been a native Netherlander and reorganized the territory into a single entity in 1548. In 1549, he would separate the Netherlands from the empire altogether. By leaving this land to Philip, he essentially makes it part of the Spanish crown. And the organization of 17 smaller provinces into one big province angered many of the local people. The different provinces had their own heritage, history, and traditions, now ruled by a single imperial regent, the land was already ripe for unrest. And all of this is happening at the same time as the Protestant Reformation, so into this political recipe, add a dash of Lutherans, a pinch of Baptists, and sprinkle with Calvinists to taste. You've got a political and religious powder keg that's ready to explode. Complicating matters, Philip II is already unpopular in the Netherlands the moment he inherits it. See, Spain itself is used to a more autocratic leadership style, but the Netherlands is used to having their local rights and privileges. Charles V, he understood this, but he apparently did not succeed in impressing it on his son. As a young man, Charles had taken Philip to the Netherlands on a visit. 
German playwright and historian Friedrich Schiller, in his book History of the Revolt of the Netherlands, describes how many of the Dutch came to view their future ruler. He writes, quote, Philip II was in all the direct opposite of his father. As ambitious as Charles, but with less knowledge of men and of the rights of man, he had formed to himself a notion of royal authority which regarded men as simply the servile instruments of despotic will and was outraged by every symptom of liberty. Born in Spain and educated under the iron discipline of the monks, he demanded of others the same gloomy formality and reserve as marked his own character. The cheerful merriment of his Flemish subjects was as uncongenial to his disposition and temper as their privileges were offensive to his imperious will. He spoke no other language but the Spanish, endured none but Spaniards about his person, and obstinately adhered to all their customs. In vain did the loyal ingenuity of the Flemish towns through which he passed vie with each other in solemnizing his arrival with costly festivities. Philip's eye remained dark. All the profusion of magnificence, all the loud and hearty effusions of the sincerest joy, could not win from him one approving smile. Charles entirely missed his aim by presenting his son to the Flemings. They might eventually have endured his yoke with less impatience if he had never set his foot in their land, but his look forewarned them what they had to expect. His entry into Brussels lost him all hearts. The emperor's gracious affability with his people only served to throw a darker shade on the haughty gravity of his son. They read in his countenance the destructive purpose against their liberties which, even then, already revolved in his breast. Forewarned to find in him a tyrant, they were forearmed to resist him. Unquote. Throughout his reign, Philip will attempt to centralize his rule and he will have differing levels of success in different places. In the Spanish crown lands of Castile and Aragon, he will face little resistance. But in the Netherlands, with their differing local traditions, people are more attached to their traditional liberties. Centralization means several things. It's a pretty broad term. On an economic front, it means taxes being paid directly to the crown, right, to keep local lords from acting as middlemen and keeping more than their share. On this front, Philip will face resistance even in Spain. In the Netherlands, collection of royal taxes is an endless nightmare. This is a challenge for Philip, since Spain is sparsely populated, while the Netherlands is one of the most densely populated developed regions in Europe and is rich on trade. Theoretically, he should be getting a disproportionately high amount of taxes from a relatively small territory. But without the ability to reliably tax these territories, Philip will have to rely on gold from his American colonies to fund his wars and he will be forced to declare bankruptcy several times. Centralization also means standardizing laws. This is not an issue for Philip in Spain, because Spain has been under one crown for some time now. But it's a challenge in the Netherlands, not just because they have different laws altogether, but again because there are multiple different provinces with their own local laws. And when I say laws, I'm talking about all kinds of laws, from criminal codes to laws of inheritance. So the government regulations that affect your everyday life. And finally, religion is also an important part of centralization. For Philip, a devout Catholic, his lands will never truly be united as long as there are Protestant heretics living and worshipping and spreading their beliefs. He revives the Spanish Inquisition, which is a popular move in Spain, but the Dutch branch of the Inquisition is very unpopular in the Netherlands, where many of the people are Protestant, and 
Even most of the Catholic population are upset at the king for exceeding his royal prerogative. Remember, the Holy Roman Empire is working on the principle of quius regio eius religio, whose realm their religion. And while the Netherlands are no longer part of the empire, they still maintain a tradition of religious tolerance. And this is especially important to them since their economy relies heavily on trade. Merchants need to travel. They need to be able to go back and forth, and they need to be able to do business with people from other countries, cultures, and creeds. They're a little bit more cosmopolitan that way. Philip's insistence on centralizing his rule across all of these areas, religion, law, and taxation, but particularly religion, this centralization would ultimately provoke the Dutch revolts, which would then become the Eighty Years' War. Philip II actually lives in the Netherlands for the first few years of his reign. It is the first of his lands that his father, Charles V, abdicates, and so Philip takes that throne first. And while he's there in the Netherlands early in his reign, uh, his wife, Queen Mary of England, is in England taking care of her own affairs. But she dies in 1558. The two never produced an heir, and Philip loses his title as King of England. Now, I never mentioned that he was King of England since it wasn't important, since he only held that title by right of marriage, and the crown goes to Mary's sister Elizabeth instead. If Philip and Mary had produced an heir, that heir would have been a Habsburg and would have inherited the English throne, and while that's all very fascinating, it's not important since it never happened. What does happen, and what is relevant about Queen Mary's death, at least to this story, is that Philip needs to go back to Spain and get remarried. Again, that marriage with Mary did not produce an heir, and so he'd better get to it. So he leaves the Netherlands probably a little sooner than he would have liked to, and he appoints his sister-in-law, a Florentine noblewoman named Margaret of Parma, as regent to rule in his place. He also creates a new council of nobles and leading merchants to advise the regent, and he appoints his old friend Cardinal Antoine de Granville, who was also a duke, as the head of this council. But the council is supposed to be representative of local nobles, and appointing a Spanish nobleman as chief counselor undercuts its entire purpose. But, most controversial of all, Philip wants to leave 4,000 Spanish troops, officially to guard the border with France. Now, there is debate about these troops even before Philip leaves the Netherlands to return to Spain. At more than one point, Threats of violence are exchanged during council debates. All of this troubles Philip, who expected the same kind of deference he would have received in Spain. The most influential of nobles to oppose Philip's centralization efforts is William, Prince of Orange. He leads the majority of the council in forcing Philip to promise to remove all Spanish troops from the Netherlands as soon as possible. This would spark Philip's anger and lead to one of history's most storied rivalries. As Philip prepares to board his ship for Spain in 1559, he can't contain his temper. As American historian John Lothrop Motley writes in his book, The Rise of the Dutch Republic, quote, Among others, William of Orange was in attendance to witness the final departure of the king and to pay him his farewell respects. As Philip was proceeding on board the ship, which was to bear him forever away from the Netherlands, his eyes lighted upon the prince. His displeasure could no longer be restrained. With angry face he turned upon him, and bitterly reproached him for having thwarted all his plans by means of his secret intrigues. William replied with humility, that everything which had taken place had been done through the regular and natural movements of the states. 
Upon this, the king, boiling with rage, seized the prince by the wrist, and shaking it violently, exclaimed in Spanish, No los estados, ma vos, vos, vos. Not the estates, but you, you, you. Repeating thrice the word vos, which is as disrespectful and uncourteous in Spanish as toi in French. After this severe and public insult, the Prince of Orange did not go on board His Majesty's vessel, but contented himself with wishing Philip from the shore a fortunate journey. Unquote. Born in 1533, William of Orange is 26 years old at this time and had originally been raised as a Lutheran in the Protestant county of Nassau in the Holy Roman Empire. But when he was twelve years old, his cousin, René of Chalon, died childless. René was the Prince of Orange, a small but militarily powerful principality in southern France. In his will, René left William his lands and title, on the condition that William receive a Catholic education. And so, young William was sent to the Netherlands, where he had inherited additional estates from René. There, he studied first in the town of Breda and then in Brussels, where he received a diplomatic and military education from none other than Antoine de Granville, who Philip would later appoint as the head of the council. During this time, Charles V, remember Philip's father, uh, he had acted as William's regent. He had ruled his estates in his place until he came of age. And he also arranged William's marriage to the heiress of a prominent Dutch family. In 1551, William became an officer in the Imperial Cavalry and was promoted to general in 1555 at the age of 22 when he commanded an army of 20,000 men in battle against the French. Charles V even tasked William with personally carrying his imperial insignia to his brother Ferdinand when he abdicated the imperial throne. So, how does this loyal ward of Charles V, practically an adopted brother to Philip II, end up leading the opposition? There are several theories, but the answer William himself gave is that when he was in France in 1559, the French king Henry II began casually talking about a conspiracy between him and Philip to stamp out all the Protestants in their lands, by the sword if necessary. William wisely played along and acted as if he was in on the plot. It's from this incident that he gets his historical nickname, William the Silent. But William while he is still a Catholic at this time, is not on board with the plan. He has friends, relatives, tenants, and business associates of all denominations. Instead, he resolves to live up to his family motto, Je m'attendrai, which literally means I maintain, but I think it would be better rendered in English as something along the lines of I hold the line. William aims to hold the line against royal abuses and to maintain religious and political freedom in the Netherlands. He claims, incidentally, always to be loyal to the king, but only to be keeping him from abusing his powers. It is in this spirit that William of Orange, along with a handful of other nobles, withdraw from the state council in protest of a continued Spanish troop presence in the Netherlands. Rather than follow his word and remove them as soon as possible, Philip would dither until 1561. Shortly thereafter, in response to some of de Granville's centralization efforts, these men once again withdraw from the council in protest. In 1564, Philip goes along and replaces de Granville. Meanwhile, there is worsening social unrest due to the establishment of the Dutch Inquisition. In the religiously diverse Netherlands, these kinds of divisions are poison to society. 
If there is a loss of social trust due to the Inquisition, especially in a religiously diverse area that is dependent on trade. William of Orange and others on the council fear that mob violence will be the result, and they petition Philip to ease up. Instead, he replies by doubling down and ordering the Inquisition to redouble its efforts. The Inquisition is separate from and superior to the secular courts. This is not based on local Dutch traditions at all, where any sort of religious court would be subservient to a secular court. Instead, it is this power imposed from outside by the king of Spain. And it would have a massive negative impact on the coherence of Dutch society. Here is another quote from Friedrich Schiller, who is admittedly a bit dramatic, but probably not by much. He says, speaking of a person arrested by the Inquisition, quote, All the benefits of the laws ceased for him. The maternal care of justice no longer noticed him. Beyond the pale of his former world, malice and stupidity judged him according to laws which were never intended for man. The delinquent never knew his accuser, and very seldom his crime. A flagitious, devilish artifice which constrained the unhappy victim to guess at his error. And in the delirium of the rack, or in the weariness of a long-lived internment, to acknowledge transgressions which, perhaps, had never been committed, or at least had never come to the knowledge of his judges. The goods of the condemned were confiscated, and the informer encouraged by letters of grace and rewards. No privilege, no civil jurisdiction was valid against the holy power. The secular arm lost forever all whom that power had once touched. Its only share in the judicial duties of the latter was to execute its sentences with humble submissiveness. The consequences of such an intrusion were, of necessity, unnatural and horrible. The whole temporal happiness, the life itself of an innocent man, was at the mercy of any worthless fellow. Every secret enemy, every envious person, had now the perilous temptation of an unseen and unfailing revenge. The security of property, the sincerity of intercourse were gone. All the ties of interest were dissolved. All of blood and of affection were irreparably broken. An infectious distrust envenomed social life. The dreaded presence of a spy terrified the eye from seeing and choked the voice in the midst of utterance. No one believed in the existence of an honest man or passed for one himself. Good name, the ties of country, brotherhood, even oaths, and all that man holds sacred were fallen in estimation. Such was the destiny to which a great and flourishing commercial town was subjugated, where 100,000 industrious men had been brought together by the single tie of mutual confidence, every one indispensable to his neighbor, yet every one distrusted and distrustful, all attracted by the spirit of gain and repelled from each other by fear, all the props of society torn away, where social union was the basis of all life and all existence. Unquote. And during this time of growing unrest, William of Orange has an even larger stake in the matter than ever. In 1561, following the death of his young wife, he has remarried to Anna of Saxony, who is a powerful noblewoman in the empire and who is also a Lutheran. Now, William is still a Catholic himself at this time, and... In the fall of 1564, he gives a speech to the council saying that while he himself is a Catholic, he will never support the right of a king to rule over the conscience of his people. 
After his speech, he once again withdraws from the council in protest. Seems like every time he joins back up, he has another reason to leave. This time, others join him in resigning. But King Philip does not back down on his demands for the Inquisition, and over the next two years, the Inquisition in the Netherlands continues to intensify. Protestants are kicked out of their churches, and traveling preachers start giving sermons in the countryside outside of towns instead. And these measures by the Inquisition do not go entirely unopposed. Throughout 1565, various provincial governors will either protest the Inquisition or refuse to enforce it altogether. 300 nobles, including William of Orange, meet in secret and agree to stop the implementation of the Inquisition by any means necessary. For the first time, there is talk of open rebellion and of seeking out foreign aid. Around the same time, Regent Margaret of Parma convinces William to become her chief advisor. She distrusts him, but she knows he is respected by Protestants and Catholics alike, and she also knows that he would be a powerful enemy. On August 10, 1566, the already fraying social fabric tears apart altogether. That evening, just outside the town of Steenvoord, a Calvinist preacher, a leper named Sebastian Mott, is leading a religious service. At the same time, the nearby convent of St. Lawrence is holding an annual procession, carrying some icons of its patron saint. Mott urges his followers to attack the procession, smash the relics, and sack the convent to destroy any other religious icons. This riot sets off a wave of riots across the Netherlands, known collectively as the Bildenstorm, or Statue Storm. It's carried out mostly by Calvinists, who strongly oppose religious iconography and artwork. Most of the damage occurs in the south of the country, which at the time is more thoroughly Protestant. Priceless medieval artworks are destroyed, so are artworks and sculptures that have just been completed, whose artists and sponsors are still alive. Rioters target churches, monasteries, convents, and other church properties. They smash statues and stained glass windows. They deface paintings and murals and urinate into church communion vessels. Sometimes the local government is able to act. This is the case in Brussels, which has a large garrison of troops. In his book, The Matter of Piety, Dutch historian Ruben Seikerbeek writes, quote, As a reaction to the news of the destructions in Antwerp on 20th August, the Brussels magistracy decided the very next day to put watchmen in the church towers, and all church wardens were advised to personally stand guard in their churches. Tensions were indeed running high, and a few days later, on 24th August, the word on the street was that a Calvinist sermon and the despoiling of Brussels' main church were being planned. The divine office was suspended, the building was closed, and guards were stationed in and around the church. One week later, on Sunday, the 1st of September, the church was opened again for a limited number of services and under heavy protection. And on the very next day, the governors had a Te Deum sung to celebrate the birth of Infanta Isabella. On this occasion, chronicler Pierre Gaffier expressed his amazement about the strict surveillance. And now there's a quote within the quote. It was very strange to see arquebusiers and a great number of armed soldiers in the church. There were so many that one only had access to the church after great pains and difficulty through a narrow passage, one after the other. End of the quote within the quote, and Seikerweik concludes, It was only on the 15th of October that the magistrates decided to officially reopen the church, albeit with limited opening hours. Unquote. 
sometimes even when the local authorities cannot physically prevent rioters from gaining access, the local people are able to get creative. Psykerbike writes of another incident, this time at the town of Dixmuid. Quote, When Sebastian Mott, the minister who had preached the notorious instigating sermon at Steenvoord, sent a small army to the city, demanding that they be let in, the magistracy stubbornly refused. Yet, although the population appears to have been predominantly Catholic, they did fear bloody reprisals and put pressure on the magistrates to let them do their job. Nevertheless, the church wardens of the parish church of St. Nicholas took the initiative to bring as much of the interior as possible to safety. During several days, some fifteen men were paid to hide or carry away most of the church's furniture. The sculptures of the rude loft were taken away, as well as the triumphal cross with the images of Our Lady and John the Baptist. The organ was partly protected, while parts of it were hidden in a parishioner's house, as was the baptismal font. Finally, wooden sculptures of the saints, de Houghton Santin, were hidden in the church tower, and the brass screen around the sacrament house was carried away. Iconoclasts indeed managed to enter the church and afflicted some damage, but later on magistrates explicitly declared that there were no citizens who had been involved. Strangers were said to have carried out an iconoclastic cleansing of the church. However, all of this had happened under the supervision of the bailiff, who made sure that the principal ornaments, including the rood loft dating from 1536 to 1543 and the presumably contemporaneous sacrament house, were spared. Unquote. Although experiences did vary from location to location, the Bildenstorm would shake the Dutch leadership, both Protestant and Catholic, to its core. A group of moderate Protestant nobles, calling themselves the Geisen, or Beggars, appealed to Regent Margaret of Parma to reach some kind of compromise. On August 23, 1566, Margaret announces an accord. Protestant religious practice is to be tolerated, as long as Catholics are not prevented from their own worship. This causes the rioting to subside, but the situation remains tense. On August 29th, Margaret writes to King Philip for help. She expects him to formally roll back the Inquisition, but... Instead, he sends an army. This army is led by the Fernando Alvarez de Toledo, the Duke of Alba. He is one of the most prestigious military commanders of his generation and has fought Protestants before during the Schmalkaldic War. If Philip II is sending his best general to the Netherlands, he means business. Before the Duke of Alba arrives, Margaret of Parma demands that all senior officials take a special oath to support the Inquisition without reservation. Several, including William the Silent, refuse. He returns to his hometown of Breda, then to Antwerp in the hopes of living quietly. And this is a bad time for the Spanish in the Netherlands to be losing any friends, or for that matter, making any enemies. With the Duke of Alba on the way, some of the Protestants have started to organize. Under the leadership of a young nobleman named Jean Marny, 2,500 Calvinists set up an armed camp in the countryside. Margaret of Parma hires a mercenary army and has the camp wiped out, and virtually all of the rebels are killed. After this battle, William the Silent fears for his family's safety. He leaves the Netherlands altogether for his estate in Nassau in the Holy Roman Empire. Along with him, he takes hundreds of servants, friends, employees, and their families. Several other nobles and merchants do the same and move out of the Netherlands to Germany or to England. When... The Duke of Alba arrives in the Netherlands in August of 1567. 
he establishes an emergency council called the Council of Troubles. This begins as a small tribunal, but expands to include several courts and panels. The purpose is to investigate and punish anyone associated with heresy or treason. One of the council's first acts is to execute two prominent noblemen, the Counts of Edgemont and Horn, for not sufficiently supporting the Inquisition. These particular men are loyal to the king, they are Catholics, they have taken the oath of loyalty that Margaret of Parma demanded, and yet they are beheaded simply for not being enthusiastic about their jobs. Alba then publishes a list of over 9,000 people who are to be executed. In practice, most of these people have already gone into voluntary exile, so only a little over a thousand are ever actually killed. But this death toll is nonetheless sufficient to earn the Council of Troubles a new nickname, the Council of Blood. Outraged, Margaret of Parma resigns as regent and returns home to Italy. This leaves Alba as the Netherlands' sole governor. Throughout 1667 and 1668, arrests and executions would continue, with the arrest warrants being announced in waves through one city then another. During this purge, more than 60,000 people flee the Netherlands, whether because they are Calvinists themselves or because their businesses or personal connections have made them subject to persecution. In 1668, William of Orange, who has converted back to the Lutheran religion of his youth, leads an invasion from Germany. He is hoping to join with another Protestant army which is going to invade the Netherlands from the south. The plan is to pin Alba in place and force him to surrender. At this time, William still claims to be loyal to King Philip and only to be fighting against a tyrannical governor and driving foreign troops from Dutch soil, but the plan quickly unravels. The Protestant army invading from the south, up from France, is defeated in the field, and a captured soldier tells the Spanish about William's coming invasion from the northeast. Alba actually pulls his troops back from that area and refuses to engage. William marches through much of the northern Netherlands without any opposition, but he is unable to force Alba into battle, and when winter comes, he is forced to disband his army and return home. But a fire has been lit in the Netherlands, and a widespread popular rebellion takes hold. It is 1668, and for the next 80 years, there will be more or less continuous conflict. Now, I normally love a good military history, but let's be serious. The 80 years war will last for 80 years. A blow-by-blow account of the war would require several episodes of its own, so I won't be getting into a ton of intricate tactical detail. But, as a matter of fact, there aren't a ton of major field battles. I mean, there are several, but not many as you would expect in a war that lasts 80 years. Most of the conflict consists of a series of sieges and relief efforts. This is due to a number of causes. Uh, Primarily, both sides, particularly early in the war, have major problems with discipline and organization. On the Spanish side, Philip II's constant financial difficulties make it impossible to consistently deliver pay. Even when a ship can be dispatched from Spain with a payment, it risks being intercepted by Dutch or English ships. At several points, Spanish troops will go on strike after a victory, wasting precious time and allowing the Dutch to recover. This isn't to say the Spanish don't fight well, though. 
For example, at the Battle of Goes in 1572, a Spanish-held fort is being besieged by an Anglo-Dutch force. The various docks and ports on the island are all under guard, so a relief force coming from land is going to have a difficult task. So instead of coming by boat, a force of 3,000 Spanish troops under the command of Cristobal de Mondragon would cross six miles of tidal flats. These are areas that are underwater during the high tide but are passable during low tide. And by passable, I mean that these 3,000 men are crossing these flats with water up to their chests. In the middle of the night, with a clock ticking, being the incoming tide, and they reach the island before the high tide returns and catch the British and Dutch by surprise and rescue their friends in the fortress. But all in all, the Spanish are constantly constrained by Philip II's finances and by the fact that they keep getting distracted by other powers. Early on, they're at war with the Ottomans. Later on, they're at war with England. And they're constantly having to deal with French Protestants who are eager to support Dutch independence. On the Dutch side, the main problem is that they have no national army. There are well-armed local militias, but they're made up of citizen soldiers who don't want to leave their hometowns. These militias are very helpful for defending an area, but they aren't going to go out into the field and win many battles. When William of Orange leads his armies, they are mostly made up of his own German troops, which introduces another problem. Many of these German troops are Catholics, so the morale isn't best when they're being asked to go fight for the religious freedom of foreign Protestants. Other Dutch forces are made up of volunteers. These are citizens who have gotten together and pooled their money and they've hired an experienced mercenary leader to lead them in battle. There are several cases where this happens and soldiers of fortune from as far away as Italy and Scotland join the Protestant side. So do English troops, although early on Queen Elizabeth tries to minimize her involvement. She uses mercenaries and other tactics to maintain plausible deniability, as they say. One area where the Dutch do very well is at sea. Being a trading country, there are a lot of Dutch-owned ships, and they're able to dominate the area around the Netherlands. And just as the Protestant nobles have labeled themselves the Geisen, or beggars, this ad hoc armada comes to be known as the Vatergeisen, or the Sea Beggars. Early on, after William's 1568 withdrawal from the Netherlands, it looks like Alba and the Spanish have the upper hand. Through 1569 and 1570, the Inquisition purge continues, although at lower levels since most people who would have been targets have left. However, the troops are expensive to finance, and Alba wants an alternative to getting ships full of gold sent from Spain. Instead, he institutes a 10% sales tax across all of the Netherlands, over the objections of the local governors who are supposed to be the ones to approve that sort of thing. This is another action, a despotic action that angers Catholics and Protestants alike. Then, in 1572, the other shoe drops for Alba. Queen Elizabeth of England closes British ports to the sea beggars. This is actually something that Philip II wanted her to do. The Spanish have been threatening war and... Like I said, Queen Elizabeth doesn't want a direct confrontation with the Spanish, so rather than go to war, she kicks the sea beggars out of English ports, and now they have nowhere safe to go. 
and without a safe harbor, the Dutch ships cannot function. So, under their commander, William Vandermark, they capture the undefended Dutch port city of Briel from the Spanish. There are some atrocities there. Notably, Vandermark orders the execution of a group of Catholic monks who refuse to renounce their faith. But the seizure of the port is the first Spanish loss in four years, and it reminds the Dutch that their overlords can be beaten, and more importantly, once again, the Dutch fleet has somewhere to harbor so, uh, all in all, all of that diplomatic pressure King Philip has been putting on Queen Elizabeth of England has backfired spectacularly. The sea beggars, rather than being defeated without a port, have bounced back bigger and badder than ever. In response to this, as well as to the tax situation, during a meeting of the nobility in July of 1572, William of Orange is proclaimed as governor-general of four of the northern provinces, Holland, Zeeland, Friesland, and Utrecht, in defiance of King Philip. This is a more widespread rebellion, with multiple cities declaring their opposition to Alba, and despite a few local successes, he is unable to put down the rebellion. And so, in 1573, Philip replaces him with a new governor, a man named Luis de Requesens y Zuniga, who had been his governor of Milan. That same year... William the Silent converts to Calvinism, a more radical reformed movement than Lutheranism, but even so, to the end of his life, he maintains committed to the cause of religious liberty. Luis de Requesens is not the governor for long. He dies unexpectedly in 1576. He has not been able to pay his men, and in November, unpaid Spanish mercenaries sack the city of Antwerp, at the time the busiest trading port in Europe. Over 8,000 civilians are killed, and similar violence breaks out in other cities. The Dutch estates agree to work together and they sign a treaty called the Pacification of Ghent, which calls for the removal of all mutinous Spanish troops. Catholic and Protestant governors alike send troops to stop the violence, with William of Orange in overall military command. In May of 1577, yet another Spanish governor arrives, Philip's half-brother, John of Austria, also known as Don Juan. He agrees to the pacification of Ghent and uses his own troops to compel the remaining Spanish mutineers to leave the Netherlands. Briefly, the estates and the provincial governors see an opening for peace. However, Don Juan still insists on stamping out Calvinism. In response, William of Orange goes to Brussels to the meeting of the estates general, that is the top nobles, the most influential merchants, and some other officials. And he puts forward a motion to accept the Calvinist provinces of Holland and Zealand as they are, without instituting the Inquisition. And the Estates General vote in favor of the motion, which puts them at odds with Don Juan. So theoretically, once again, all the provinces are now in open rebellion in what is now called the Union of Brussels, since their vote was held in Brussels. But in practice, the French-speaking southern provinces and some of the more Catholic eastern provinces remain loyal to Spain. In January of 1578, one of the most important battles of the war happened the Battle of Gembleau in modern-day Belgium. William of Orange is not present at the battle, but several top Dutch commanders are. They lead an army of around 25,000 men, but most of them are poorly armed. 
Many are sick or malnourished due to the hard winter campaigning. The army is moving from one city to another and has just crossed the Meuse River to try and get away from Don Juan's army. On the night of January 3rd, Don Juan sets up camp on the other side of the river. The Spanish army is smaller than the Dutch, but it's better armed. 9,000 Spanish troops, almost all of them veterans, form the bulk of the army. They're joined by 4,000 troops from Lorraine and several thousand less well-armed troops from the loyal provinces of Luxembourg and Namur. On the morning of January 31st, Don Juan orders his troops to cross the river. His half-nephew, Alexander Farnese, commands the 1,200 Spanish cavalry in the vanguard. Farnese is under orders only to deploy his men and protect a beachhead for the main army to get across. He engages in some light skirmishing with the less numerous Dutch cavalry, which is also fighting a screening action, trying to buy time for the Dutch infantry to escape to the safety of the walled city of Gemblo. Farnese sees the poor condition of the Dutch troops and that they're really just trying to get away, and when the Dutch cavalry goes into a full retreat, he pursues them, and he ends up catching up with the main army. The Dutch infantry are caught off guard, and the ordered retreat turns into a rout. Roughly 6,000 of the Dutch are killed in the cavalry charge, with only about a dozen of Farnese's soldiers lost. Eventually, some of the more experienced Dutch troops, including Scottish mercenaries, manage to form a defensive line, but there's an accident with one of their cannons and it blows up, killing the crew and several surrounding soldiers and again causing a panic. By the time they reform once more, they're already exhausted and demoralized and Don Juan is able to send in his fresh infantry and surround them. Only a few thousand escape to Gemblo, and they are forced to surrender within a few days. So, with one blow, Don Juan and Alexander Farnese have defeated the rebels' main army and put an end to the Union of Brussels in all but name. But help is on the way. Queen Elizabeth of England and the Duke of Anjou send more troops to help. They set up camp outside the Belgian city of Rijmenam. Don Juan attempts to force them out in July of 1578, but his army is defeated and he is forced to withdraw. The Eighty Years' War has now become an opportunity for all Protestant powers to strike a blow at the hated Habsburgs. That's the danger of being the number one world power. Everyone wants to take you down a peg. Shortly after the Battle of Rijmenam, Don Juan dies from typhus, and Alexander Farnese takes over as the new Spanish governor. In January of 1579, three Catholic southern provinces, Hainaut, Artois, and Walloon Flanders, formally leave the Union of Brussels and swear loyalty to King Philip. So the Union of Brussels is now officially dead. But William of Orange is already trying to reform a coalition of his own. Later in January 1579, he announces the formation of his own union, the Union of Utrecht. This is an alliance between the northern Dutch provinces of Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Gilders, and Groningen. Brabant and Flanders would join the Union of Utrecht in February. The Netherlands are now divided into seven northern provinces in open rebellion, three loyal southern provinces, and seven provinces in the middle who are mostly just sick of all the fighting. With William of Orange, now the undisputed military leader of an undisputed separatist movement, Philip II puts out an official warrant for his death or capture. 
He promises a fantastic reward of 25,000 crowns, which... Well, I did the math, and assuming we're talking about Spanish reals, that's about $60,000 in today's money, so not all that much. But he also offers a noble title and an estate, which isn't just worth social prestige, it's worth literally millions of dollars in today's money, and it's inheritable. So, all in all, this is quite the enticement for a would-be assassin. Remember that. But meanwhile, the Dutch rebels decide they need a king. And in 1580, William of Orange officially invites Francois, the Duke of Anjou, the French king's brother, to take the throne of the Netherlands. Francois accepts, and in 1581, the Dutch Estates General makes a formal proclamation called the Act of Objuration. In it, they say that the King of Spain has so badly failed the people of the Netherlands that they have been forced to seek out a new one. I'm going to read this, and it's a bit long, but it's important to understand that there are major ideas in this document. These are ideas about rights and privileges of different nations and the right of a people to have freedom within their own homes and to set the course of policy within their own lands. It actually sounds a lot like the American Declaration of Independence. The first portion is mostly a list of grievances. Anyway... Here's what the Estates General write in their act of abjuration. They write, quote, The States General of the United Provinces of the Low Countries, to all whom it may concern, do by these presents send greeting. As it is apparent to all that a prince is constituted by God to be ruler of a people, to defend them from oppression and violence as the shepherd his sheep, and whereas God did not create the people slaves to their prince to obey his commands, whether right or wrong, but rather the prince for the sake of the subjects, without which he could be no prince, to govern them according to equity, love, and support them as a father his children, or a shepherd his flock, and even at the hazard of life to defend and preserve them. And when he does not behave thus, but on the contrary, oppresses them, seeking opportunities to infringe their ancient customs and privileges, exacting from them slavish compliance, then he is no longer a prince but a tyrant, and the subjects are to consider him in no other view. And particularly when this is done deliberately, unauthorized by the states, they may not only disallow his authority, but legally proceed to the choice of another prince for their defense." This is the only method left for subjects whose humble petitions and remonstrances could never soften their prince or dissuade him from his tyrannical proceedings. And this is what the law of nature dictates for the defense of liberty, which we ought to transmit to posterity even at the hazard of our lives. And this we have seen done frequently in several countries upon the like occasion whereof there are notorious instances, and more justifiable in our land, which has always been governed according to their ancient privileges, which are expressed in the oath taken by the prince at his admission to the government. For most of the provinces receive their prince upon certain conditions, which he swears to maintain, which, if the prince violates, he is no longer sovereign. Now thus it was that the king of Spain, after the demise of the emperor his father, Charles V, of the glorious memory, of whom he received all these provinces, forgetting the services done by the subjects of these countries, both to his father and himself, by whose valor he got so glorious and memorable victories over his enemies that his name and power became famous and dreaded all over the world, forgetting also the advice of said imperial majesty, made to him before the contrary, did rather hearken to the counsel of those Spaniards about him, who had conceived a secret hatred to this land and to its liberty, because they could not enjoy posts of honor and high employments here under the states as in Naples, Sicily, Milan, and the Indies, and other countries under the king's dominion. Thus, allured by the riches of the said provinces, 
wherewith many of them were well acquainted. The said counselors, we say, or the principal of them, frequently remonstrated to the king that it was more for his majesty's reputation and grandeur to subdue the low countries a second time, and to make himself absolute, by which they mean to tyrannize at pleasure, than to govern according to the restrictions he had accepted, and at his admission sworn to observe. From that time forward, the king of Spain, following these evil counselors, sought by all means possible to reduce this country, stripping them of their ancient privileges to slavery, under the government of Spaniards having first, under the mask of religion, endeavored to settle new bishops in the largest and principal cities, endowing and incorporating them with the richest of abbeys, assigning to each bishop nine canons to assist him as counselors, three whereof should superintend the Inquisition. By this incorporation, the said bishops, who might be strangers as well as natives, would have had the first place and vote in the assembly of the states, and always the prince's creatures at devotion. And by the addition of the said canons, he would have introduced the Spanish Inquisition, which has been always as dreadful and detested in these provinces as the worst of slavery, as is well known, in so much that his imperial majesty, having once proposed it to these states, and upon whose remonstrances did desist and entirely gave it up, hereby giving proof of the great affection he had for his subjects, that is, they are referring to Charles V, anyway, continuing, but, notwithstanding the many remonstrances made to the king both by the provinces and particular towns, in writing as well as by some principal lords by word of mouth, and namely by the Baron of Montigny, an Earl of Edgemont, who with the approbation of the Duchess of Parma, then governess of the Low Countries, by the advice of the Council of State, were sent several times to Spain upon this affair. And, although the king had by fair words given them grounds to hope that their request should be complied with, yet by his letters he ordered the contrary, soon after expressly commanding, upon pain of his displeasure, to admit the new bishops immediately, and put them in possession of their bishoprics and incorporated abbeys, to hold the court of the Inquisition in the places where it had been before, to obey and follow the decrees and ordinances of the Council of Trent, which in many articles are destructive of the privileges of the country. This being come to the knowledge of the people gave just occasion to great uneasiness and clamor among them, and lessened that good affection that they had always borne towards the king and his predecessors and especially seeing that he did not only seek to tyrannize over their persons and estates, but also over their consciences, for which they believed themselves accountable to God only. Upon this occasion, the chief of the nobility in compassion to the poor people, in the year 1566, exhibited a certain remonstrance in form of a petition, humbly praying, in order to appease them and prevent public disturbances, that it would please his majesty, by showing that clemency due from a good prince to his people, to soften the said points, and especially with regard to the rigorous inquisition and capital punishments for matters of religion, and to inform the king of this affair in a more solemn manner, and to represent to him how necessary it was for the peace and prosperity of the public to remove the aforesaid innovations, and moderate the severity of his declarations published concerning divine worship. The Marquis de Bergen and the aforesaid Baron of Montigny had been sent, at the request of the said Lady Regent, Council of State, and of the States General as ambassadors to Spain, where the King, instead of giving them audience and redress the grievances they had complained of, which, for want of a timely remedy, did always appear in their evil consequences among the common people, did, by the advice of Spanish counsel, declare all those who were concerned in preparing the said remonstrance to be rebels, and guilty of high treason, and to be punished with death, and confiscation of their estates, and what is more, thinking himself well assured of reducing these countries under absolute tyranny by the army of the Duke of Alba, did soon after imprison and put to death the said lords and ambassadors, and even confiscated their estates, contrary to the law of nations, which is always religiously observed, even among the most tyrannical and barbarous princes. And although the said disturbances, 
which in the year 1566 happened on the aforementioned occasion, were now appeased by the governess and her ministers, and many friends to liberty were either banished or subdued, insomuch that the king had not any show of reason to use arms and violence, and further suppress this country. Yet, for these causes and reasons, long time before sought by the Council of Spain, as appears by intercepted letters from the Spanish ambassador, Alana, then in France, writ to the Duchess of Parma, to annul all the privileges of this country, and govern it tyrannically at pleasure as in the Indies. And in their new conquests he has, at the instigation of the Council of Spain, showing the little regard he had for his people, so contrary to the duty which a good prince owes his subjects, sent the Duke of Alba with a powerful army to oppress this land, who for his inhuman cruelties is looked upon as one of its greatest enemies, accompanied with counselors too like himself. And, although he came in without the least opposition, and was received by the poor subjects with all marks of honor and clemency which the king had often hypocritically promised in his letters, and that himself intended to come in person to give orders to their general satisfaction, having since the departure of the Duke of Alba equipped a fleet to carry him from Spain, and another in Zealand to come to meet him at the great expense of the country, the better to deceive his subjects and allure them into the toils." Nevertheless, the said duke, immediately after his arrival, though a stranger and in no way related to the royal family, declared that he had a captain general's commission, and soon after that of governor of these provinces, contrary to all its ancient customs and privileges, and, the more to manifest his designs, he immediately garrisoned the principal towns and castles, and caused fortresses and citadels to be built in the great cities to awe them into subjection and very courteously sent for the chief nobility in the king's name, under pretense of taking their advice, and to employ them in the service of their country. And those who believed his letters were seized and carried out of Brabant, contrary to law, where they were imprisoned and prosecuted as criminals before him who had no right, nor could be a competent judge. And at last he, without hearing their defense at large, sentenced them to death, which was publicly and ignominiously executed. The others, better acquainted with Spanish hypocrisy, residing in foreign countries, were declared outlawed, and had their estates confiscated, so that the poor subjects could make no use of their fortresses, nor be assisted by their princes in defense of their liberty against the violence of the Pope. Besides a great number of other gentlemen and substantial citizens, some of whom were executed, and others banished that their estates might be confiscated, plaguing the other honest inhabitants not only by the injuries done to their wives, children, and estates by the Spanish soldiers lodged in their houses, as likewise by diverse contributions, which they were forced to pay towards building citadels and new fortifications of towns even to their own ruin. Besides the taxes of the hundredth, twentieth, and tenth penny, to pay both the foreign and those raised in the country to be employed against their fellow citizens, and against those who at the hazard of their lives defended their liberties. In order to impoverish the subjects, and to incapacitate them to hinder his design, and that he might with more ease execute the instructions received in Spain, to treat these countries as new conquests, he began to alter the course of justice after the Spanish mode, directly contrary to our privileges, and imagining at last he had nothing more to fear he endeavored by main force to settle a tax called the tenth penny on merchandise and manufacture, to the total ruin of these countries, the prosperity of which depends upon a flourishing trade, notwithstanding frequent remonstrances, not by a single province only, but by all of them united, which he had effected had it not been for the Prince of Orange with diverse gentlemen and other inhabitants, who had followed this prince in his exile, most of whom were in his pay, and banished by the Duke of Alba, with others who between him and the states of all the provinces, on the contrary sought, by all possible promises made to the colonels already at his devotion, to gain the German troops, who were then garrisoned in the principal fortresses in the cities, that by their assistance he might master them, as he had gained many of them already, and held them attached to his interest and order by their assistance, to force those who would not join with him in making war against the Prince of Orange, and the provinces of Holland and Zealand, more cruel and bloody than any war before. But, as no disguises can long conceal our intentions, 
This project was discovered before it could be executed, and he, unable to perform his promises, and instead of that peace so much boasted of at his arrival, a new war kindled, not yet extinguished. All these considerations gave us more than sufficient reason to renounce the king of Spain, and seek some other powerful and more gracious prince to take us under his protection, and, more especially, as these countries have been for these twenty years abandoned to disturbance and oppression by their king, during which time the inhabitants were not treated as subjects but enemies, enslaved forcibly by their own governors. Having also, after the decease of Don Juan, sufficiently declared by the Baron de Selles that he would not allow the pacification of Ghent, the which Don Juan had in his majesty's name sworn to maintain, but daily proposing new terms of agreement less advantageous. Notwithstanding these discouragements, we used all possible means by petitions in writing, and the good offices of the greatest princes in Christendom, to be reconciled to our king, having lastly maintained for a long time our deputies at the Congress of Cologne, hoping that the intercession of his imperial majesty and of the electors would procure an honorable and lasting peace, and some degree of liberty, particularly relating to religion, which chiefly concerns God and our own consciences. At last we found by experience that nothing would be obtained of the king by prayers and treaties, which latter he made use of to divide and weaken the provinces, that he might the easier execute his plan rigorously, by subduing them one by one, which afterwards plainly appeared by certain proclamations and prescriptions published by the king's orders, by virtue of which, we and all officers of the United Provinces, with all our friends, are declared rebels, and as such to have forfeited our lives and estates. Thus, by rendering us odious to all, he might interrupt our commerce, likewise reducing us to despair, offering a great sum to any that would assassinate the Prince of Orange. So, having no hope of reconciliation and finding no other remedy, we have, agreeable to the law of nature in our own defense, and for maintaining the rights, privileges, and liberties of our countrymen, wives, and children, and latest posterity from being enslaved by the Spaniards, been constrained to renounce our allegiance to the King of Spain, and to pursue such methods as appear to us most likely to secure our ancient liberties and privileges. Know all men by these presents that being reduced to the last extremity as mentioned above, we have unanimously and deliberately declared, and do by these presents declare, that the King of Spain has forfeited, ipso jure, all hereditary right to the sovereignty of those countries, and are determined from henceforward not to acknowledge his sovereignty or jurisdiction, nor any act of his relating to the domains of the Low Countries, nor make use of his name as Prince, nor suffer others to do it. In consequence whereof, we also declare all officers, judges, lords, gentlemen, vassals, and all other the inhabitants of this country, of what condition or quality whatsoever, to henceforth be discharged from all oaths and obligations whatsoever made to the King of Spain as sovereign of those countries. And whereas, upon the motives already mentioned, the greater part of the United Provinces have, by common consent of their members, submitted to the government and sovereignty of the illustrious Prince and Duke of Anjou, upon certain conditions stipulated with His Highness, and whereas the most serene Archduke Matthias has resigned the government of these countries with our approbation, we commend and order all justiciaries, officers, and all whom it may concern, not to make use of the name, titles, great or privy seal of the King of Spain from henceforward, but in lieu of them, as long as His Highness the Duke of Anjou is absent upon urgent affairs relating to the welfare of these countries, having so agreed with His Highness or otherwise, they shall provisionally use the name and title of the President and Council of the Province. And, until such a President and Councillors shall be nominated, assembled, and act in that capacity, they shall act in our name, except that in Holland and Zealand, where they shall use the name of the Prince of Orange, and of the states of the said provinces, until the aforesaid council shall legally sit, and then shall confirm to the directions of that council agreeable to the contract made with His Highness. And, instead of the King's seal aforesaid, they shall make use of our great seal, center seal and signet, in affairs relating to the public, 
according as the said council shall from time to time be authorized. And in affairs concerning the administration of justice and transactions peculiar to each province, the provincial council and other councils of that country shall use respectively the name, title, and seal of the said province, where the case is to be tried, and no other, on pain of having all letters, documents, and dispatches annulled. And for the better and effectual performance hereof, we have ordered and commanded, and do hereby order and command, that all the seals of the King of Spain which are in these united provinces shall immediately upon the publication of these present be delivered to the estate of each province respectively, or to such persons as by the said estates shall be authorized and appointed, upon peril of discretionary punishment. Moreover, we order and command that from henceforth no money coins shall be stamped with the name, title, or arms of the King of Spain in any of these united provinces, but that all new gold and silver pieces, with their halves and quarters, shall only bear such impressions as the state shall direct. We order likewise and command the President and other lords of the Privy Council, and all other chancellors, presidents, accountants general, and others in all the chambers of accounts respectively in these said countries, and likewise to all other judges and officers, as we hold them discharged henceforth from their oath made to the King of Spain, pursuant to the tenor of their commission, that they shall take a new oath to the states of that country on whose jurisdiction they depend, or to commissaries appointed by them, to be true to us against the King of Spain and all his adherents, according to the formula of words prepared by the states general for that purpose. And we shall give to the said counselors, justiciaries, and officers employed in these provinces, who have contracted in our name with His Highness the Duke of Anjou, an act to continue them in their respective offices, instead of new commissions, a clause annulling the former provisionally until the arrival of His Highness. Moreover, to all such counselors, accountants, justiciaries, and officers in these provinces, who have not contracted with His Highness aforesaid, we shall grant new commissions under our hands and seals, unless any of the said officers are accused and convicted of having acted under their former commissions against the liberties and privileges of this country, or of the other like maladministration. We further command of the President and members of the Privy Council, Chancellor of the Duchy of Brabant, also the Chancellor of the Duchy of Gelders, and country of Zutphen, to the President and members of the Council of Holland, to the receivers of great officers of Boerstelt and Bewernstelt in Zeeland, to the President and Council of Fries, and to the Escolé of Mechelen, to the President and members of the Council of Utrecht, and to all other justiciaries and officers whom it may concern, to the lieutenants all and every one of them, to cause this our ordinance to be published and proclaimed throughout their respective jurisdictions, in the usual places appointed for that purpose, that none may plead ignorance, and to cause our said ordinance to be observed inviolably, punishing the offenders impartially and without delay, for so it is found expedient for the public good. And for better maintaining all and every article hereof, we give to all and every one of you, by express command, full power and authority. In witness whereof, we have hereunto set our hands and seals, dated in our assembly at The Hague, the six and twentieth day of July, 1581. Unquote. There's a lot to unpack in that. A lot of that was just a flowery synopsis of the events leading up to the Dutch Rebellion, but hopefully it re-emphasizes some of the reasons for that rebellion. Their main argument is that the king is exceeding his prerogatives, that their local traditions, their local laws are just being swept under the rug, and instead they are being imposed on from above. And so they have selected Francois of Anjou, the brother of the French king, to be their new king. Now, Francois of Anjou does not arrive to take the throne until six months later, in February of 1582. But when he does, he makes a mistake. 
See, while the general estates may have asked him to be king, some of the Dutch cities, including the city of Antwerp, are still opposed to his rule. Uh, to them, he's just another foreign king, and they don't want his troops inside their walls. And Francois, like Philip, does not really understand the Dutch traditions of local rule. So he tries to take over Antwerp by trickery. He convinces the local officials to let him hold a military parade through the city so that the people can welcome him. And his intention is to wait for the parade to be over, and then, now that his troops are inside the city, to have them take the walls and fortifications before anybody can react. But the local militia gets wind of Francois's plans, and they set up an ambush. And as he is parading through the streets, a group of local militia attacks his troops and kills a bunch of them once they're inside, and Francois barely escapes from Antwerp alive. And he runs back to Anjou with his tail between his legs, and he will never again lead an army in the field or do anything of political importance. But this puts the Dutch Estates General in a pickle. Uh, their king has just run off, so... They do the logical thing. They look for another monarch. Uh, they ask Queen Elizabeth of England to come in and act as their queen, and she refuses. Again, so far, her assistance to the rebels has been unofficial, and if she doesn't want to get into a war with Philip, she certainly can't go claiming the Dutch throne. That is practically going to force Philip into war, so she doesn't want to do that. And now the Dutch are even in a bigger pickle because they are running out of Protestant monarchs to ask to come rule their country. So they do the obvious thing, and they make William of Orange their leader. But rather than make him king, they decide to resurrect an old title and make him the Count of Holland. And he agrees to go along with this. But before William can take leadership, before his new title can be made official, fate will intervene once again. And it will intervene in the form of a young Frenchman named Balthazar Girard. Girard is a recent law school graduate and a fervent Catholic who has heard of King Philip's bounty on William of Orange. In May of 1584, he travels to the city of Delft, where William the Silent is staying at an old monastery that has been converted into a palace called the Prisonhof. There, Gerard presents himself as a friend and shows William a seal from Ernst von Mansfeld, the governor of Luxembourg and one of William's enemies. With this seal, William can now forge letters from the governor. It's a great gift, and William thanks Gerard, and he sends him with the seal to his French Protestant allies so that they can also make forgeries in the Duke of Luxembourg's name. And Gerard does this, all the while keeping in the back of his mind how he is eventually going to kill William. He returns in July, and he is waiting around outside the prison hof in the city square of Delft, performing reconnaissance, if you would. And while he's standing around outside, he is approached by a guard who asks what he is doing. Well, he, uh, he lies, and he says that he wants to worship at the church across the square, but he's ashamed to go in because he's so badly dressed. So the guard actually goes into the prison hof and comes back with 50 crowns from William the Silent himself, so Gerard can go buy some nice clothes. But he doesn't use this money to buy clothes. Instead, he buys a pair of pistols, conceals them, and bides his time. Two days later, on July 10th, 1584, he enters the prison hof to attend an official meeting with William. 
but he hides in a shadowed nook at the bottom of a flight of stairs. When William comes downstairs from having dinner, Gerard jumps out and shoots him in the chest with one of the pistols. He tries to run away, but he's captured by the guards before he can even get out of the building. William's sister rushes to his side, but he's clearly dying, and William of Orange's last words are, My God, have mercy on me and on my poor people. Gerard is taken into custody and tortured, but when his torturers call him a traitor, he says that he is a loyal servant of his lord. And when they ask him which lord, he replies, Of my lord and master, the king of Spain. He will soon be subjected to one of the most gruesome executions in European history. I will spare you the accounts of the three days of torture he endures beforehand. Suffice it to say that by the day of his execution he cannot walk and most of his skin is badly burned. Then his right hand is burned off with an iron, representing the hand that killed William of Orange. And as he is paraded through the city... He is stopped in six different places where the executioner takes red-hot pinchers and rips chunks of flesh from his body. He is then forced up onto a scaffold where his arms and legs are cut off, supposedly while he is still alive. Then he is disemboweled and his beating heart is cut out from his chest and thrown in his face. Finally, he is beheaded, and his head and limbs are put on spikes throughout the city. And so ends the man who killed William of Orange. For what it's worth, Philip II actually does pay out his bounty to Gerard's family. He doesn't pay cash, but he awards them instead of with one estate with three prosperous estates, and he elevates the family to the nobility. Seems like the least Philip can do for a guy who went through so much to rid him of his most hated rival. About a year after William of Orange's assassination... On August 10th, 1585, Queen Elizabeth of England officially enters the war on the Dutch side. She signs an agreement with the Dutch rebels and one of her top military commanders, Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, is to become the new Dutch governor general. Although Elizabeth still does not agree to become queen, she does, however, dispatch Dudley to the Netherlands with a large armed force. But before this force can even land in the Netherlands, apparent disaster strikes the Dutch rebels. After a 13-month siege, a Spanish army under Alexander Farnese retakes the southern city of Antwerp from the Dutch. However... This does not go as Farnessa expects. Of the 100,000 inhabitants of the city, over 60,000 leave and move north to more Protestant-friendly territories. Not only that, but the Dutch fleet in the harbor does not surrender and maintains a blockade of the port instead. This leads to Antwerp's permanent decline as the greatest port in Western Europe. With the port blockaded and most of the merchants and other people relocated, the trade goes elsewhere. So instead, the northern port of Rotterdam grows to prominence, and so does a little town you might have heard of, the major North Sea port of Amsterdam. Farnessa has won his prize, but in so doing, he has destroyed its value. Antwerp will never again be the jewel of the Netherlands. 
And even as the territories in the southern Netherlands, the Spanish loyal territories, continue to stagnate, the northern Protestant provinces continue to grow, not just because of Dutch migration, but also because of foreign migration. Oppressed Protestants from France and Jews from all over Europe flock to the region to enjoy religious liberty, even under the threat of Spanish arms. Shortly after the fall of Antwerp, Robert Dudley, the new English governor general, arrives in the Netherlands, and he immediately tries to institute a new tax system outside the purview of the local nobles. This sets him at odds with them immediately, and as a result of difficulty obtaining taxes, Dudley will be forced to fund his army by himself. Throughout 1586 and 1587, there are continued skirmishes, and in 1587, Dudley loses the port of Slui to the Spanish because the local nobles won't provide him with forces for the relief. This is the last straw. These people have asked him to come help, and it seems like they're not willing to help him help them, so Dudley returns to England and resigns his post as governor general. The Dutch are once again leaderless, and so the member provinces of the Union of Utrecht, that is Brabant, Flanders, Gilders, Groningen, Holland, Utrecht, and Zeeland, uh, they decide to form a republic. Uh, they become officially the Seven United Provinces, better known to history as the Dutch Republic. Unfortunately, they are badly outmatched by the Spanish, but Philip II becomes overconfident and decides to fight the English directly. He gets a little bit distracted from events on the ground in the Netherlands because, right, he's at war with England now as well. And in 1588, he assembles a grand armada to invade England. This is a fleet of 130 ships with over 17,000 soldiers and 7,000 sailors. It's the Spanish Armada. And at this time, the Royal Navy isn't the world-beating force it would one day become. While Elizabeth is able to assemble nearly 200 ships, that's more than the Spanish fleet, but... Only 37 of them are proper warships. The rest are small privateering ships and merchant vessels. More importantly, in terms of cannon, the Spanish have the English outgunned two to one. The Spanish Armada sets sail towards the Netherlands first, rather than England. They are supposed to pick up an army there under Alexander Farnese, it is supposed to help with the invasion of England. And the British fleet under Sir Francis Drake sails to intercept them. And they engage in a couple of small engagements, and they even capture two Spanish ships that have collided with each other. But the Spanish armada is still approaching. The danger is palpable. In fact, Queen Elizabeth anticipates that her fleet is likely to fail and that the Spanish are most likely going to be landing an army on English shores. So she assembles a land army of her own under the command of Robert Dudley. And on August 9, 1588, she gives the following address to the public at the town of Tilbury. You can almost hear echoes of Winston Churchill saying, We will fight them on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. And so on and so forth. It's a promise to her people to make a determined defense. And she says, quote, My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that 
Under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore I am come amongst you, as you see, at this time not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved, in the midst and heat of battle, to live and die among you all, and to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and my people my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England, too, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonor shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general judge and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already, for your forwardness you have deserved rewards and crowns, and we do assure you on word of a prince that they shall be duly paid. In the meantime, my lieutenant general should be in my stead, than whom never prince commanded a more noble or worthy subject. Not doubting, but by your obedience to my general, by your concord in the camp and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over these enemies of my God, my kingdom, and of my people. Unquote. Now, as I mentioned, uh, to assist in the invasion of England, Philip II orders Alexander Farnessa to Flanders, to the southern Netherlands coast, where the Spanish fleet will pick him up on their way to England. But when the Spanish fleet gets there, they have a little bit of a problem. The water off the coast of Flanders in this particular area is very shallow. It's so shallow that while the smaller Dutch ships defending the area can operate freely in those waters, the deep-drafted Spanish galleons cannot. Much of their fleet is not going to be able to sail all the way to shore to get Alexander Farnese. They're going to have to use a handful of smaller ships to shuttle his army across to the main fleet, and those ships, while they are in coastal waters, will be vulnerable to the Dutch and uh, could very well be sunk. So the Spanish fleet is unable to immediately collect Farnes's army. Uh, Instead, they sit off the coast for a couple of days, figuring out what to do. And while they are still off the coast, the English fleet arrives in the night of July 28th. And they send eight fire ships towards the Spanish fleet at anchor. These are empty ships that have been set on fire and let loose to drift towards the Spanish. And although no Spanish ships are lost to the fire ships, the fleet scatters, and Spanish Admiral Medina Sidonia spends the next 11 days rounding them all up again. And after this, he takes the fleet to the port of Gravelines, the closest Dutch port to France. This puts the Spanish fleet at the far edge of the waters that the Dutch control and close to uh, the French, who are at this time at least somewhat friendly towards a fellow Catholic power at war with Protestants. And The plan is for the Spanish fleet now to wait at uh, Gravelons and wait there for Alexander Farnese's army to walk down the coast a ways and get on board. But that doesn't happen. Before Farnese can get there, on August 8th, the English attack again. This time they don't use fire ships. They come close to the Spanish using their smaller and more maneuverable ships and draw their fire at long range. Now, I said that the Spanish fleet outgunned the English. That is true in terms of poundage, but the smaller and smaller number of guns that the English have have a major advantage. They have a longer range. So while the Spanish are 
firing away uh, somewhat ineffectively, the English are able to get in a few good shots. And then when the Spanish start running low on ammo, uh, the English get in closer and closer and really pound on the Spanish fleet. And by the end of the day, five Spanish ships have either sunk or run themselves aground. More importantly, the rest of them are out of ammunition, badly damaged, and far from a friendly port. Now, if the wind is coming out of the north at this time, the situation is still somewhat salvageable. The fleet can limp back to Spain and refit and maybe try again next year. But instead, the wind is out of the south. So rather than sail right back to Spain, the Armada has to sail all the way around Great Britain on its way home. Now, they don't come under any kind of heavy attack during this. Francis Drake's fleet has had to return to England to uh, resupply. They themselves shot most of their ammunition in the battle. By the end, a lot of the English ships were literally loading their cannons with chains or cutlery or anything else they could shove into the cannon to use for ammunition. So they have to go home. So at least the Spanish Armada is not being harassed all the way around Britain, but they don't have the supplies for this journey. And the crews suffer badly. And again, these are damaged ships for the large part. They're moving slowly. A lot of them sink during the journey. And those crews who are unfortunate enough to wash up on British shores, all too often they meet their ends very quickly at the hands of angry locals. So the final tally of Philip II's Grand Armada will be 35 ships lost, along with approximately 20,000 men, mostly due to sickness and malnutrition in the final weeks of the voyage. England tries to launch their own armada a year later in 1589, but it is also defeated, however, not nearly as badly, and the Spanish lose more ships driving off the attempted English invasion, and from this they will never recover. They will never again be the undisputed, dominant naval power in the world. And the English will continue to grow in power from here until the 20th century. Not only that, but the war with England has distracted Philip from the Dutch Revolt, and he has not only been distracted, he has not been funding Farnessa as well as he should. Not only has he had Farnessa over on the coast of Flanders waiting for the Armada instead of out fighting the Dutch, he's not funding him very well. And this effectively paralyzes Farnessa. He can't motivate troops that aren't being paid. And this forces him to become stagnant, and it allows the United Provinces to rebuild their strength. As a matter of fact, they had started doing this as early as 1587. At the same time that the Estates General declared the foundation of a republic, they also appointed Maurice of Nassau, that is William of Orange's son. He's called Maurice of Nassau because his main estate is in Nassau in the Holy Roman Empire. Anyway, William of Orange's son, Maurice of Nassau, becomes the new Captain General of the newly founded Dutch National Army. And Maurice proves a worthy heir to his father. He quickly organizes this army, which the locals are more than willing to provide out of respect for the House of Orange. They trust Maurice. They don't see him as a foreign tyrant. They see him as a Dutch military commander asking for their help, and help him they do. Around the same time, another assassination changes the course of the war, but this time in favor of the Dutch. On August 1st, 1589, right around the same time the English are trying and failing to invade Spain, at pretty much that exact time, 
Henry III of France is stabbed by an assassin. And Henry will be succeeded by Henry IV, who is a Protestant. And a group of Catholic French nobles, calling themselves the Catholic League, uh, they rebel against Henry IV's rule. Philip of Spain joins the League. Number one, he is very, very strongly Catholic. He certainly doesn't want another Protestant power in Europe. For another thing, anything he can do to get involved in France can ultimately be used to help weaken the French in one way or another, right? Even if he gets rid of this Protestant king and gets a Catholic king put on the French throne, uh, that king's going to owe him one. So, what does King Philip of Spain do? Well, he diverts Alexander Farnese from the Netherlands and has him march south into France to fight Henry IV. This war will last for about five years, until 1594, and it will end somewhat anticlimactically when Henry IV simply converts to Catholicism to end the war. This takes the wind out of the sails of the Catholic League, and they end up swearing loyalty to him. And Henry IV famously says, Paris is worth a mass. So, not exactly a man of religious principle, but a guy who enjoys being king. But this whole five-year distraction in France, well, it gives Maurice of Nassau an opportunity to take advantage, and he does. Right, the Spanish-held cities and fortresses in the Netherlands are only held by small garrisons at this point, and so... Maurice conquers a whole series of them because these garrisons are more or less helpless without support from a field army. And so by the end of the religious war in France, the northern Netherlands are once again firmly in Protestant hands, while the southern provinces remain loyal to Philip. And the fighting in the Netherlands during this time is not even in the Protestant heartland. It's all in the border areas and the coastal provinces of Holland and Zeeland are peaceful. So their economies continue to grow and prosper. In the summer of 1596, shortly after Philip has finally gotten himself disengaged from France, in 1596, an Anglo-Dutch fleet attacks the Spanish port of Cadiz. Dozens of ships are burned at anchor, and the entire city is sacked. The English even capture several leading nobles and take them back to England for ransom. Later that year, largely as a result of the sack and the loss of so many goods, Philip II will declare one of his many bankruptcies. Maurice launches another offensive the following year in 1597 capturing several more fortresses. By now, Spain has sent some more troops to the area, but they are under the command and pay of a local leader, the Archduke Albert of Austria, and they are poorly funded due to the Spanish bankruptcy. In 1598, a year later, Philip II dies, and he leaves the kingdom to his son, Philip III. Philip III is less fixated on centralization than his father. And the Spanish and the Dutch enter into secret peace talks. But decades of war and mutual distrust keep negotiations from proceeding. Maurice fights the Spanish one more time. At least one more major time in the Battle of Newport in 1600. The battle is a tactical victory over Albert's Spanish army, but it's a strategic draw since neither side can follow up. From there, the war continues on the sea, but neither side launches any major land offenses. Instead, the Protestant United Provinces in the north build fortress after fortress to protect their gains. 
the Spanish in the South do the same. In 1605 and 1606, the Spanish have yet a new overlord, Ambrosio Spinola, and he would launch a pair of offensives, take some Dutch land, but Maurice would take most of that land back in a winter campaign between 1606 and 1607. In 1609, 41 years after the official outbreak of hostilities, the two sides sign a 12-year ceasefire, which comes to be known as the 12 Years Truce. In the ceasefire, the Spanish agree to recognize the United Provinces, while the United Provinces recognize Spanish rule in the southern Netherlands, the areas we now call Belgium and Luxembourg. In the treaty, both sides recognize the right of migration of the Dutch people. Catholics are free to leave the north and travel into Catholic land, and Protestants are free to move north to Protestant land. Finally, both sides are to cease all acts of piracy and respect each other's freedom of navigation. During this time period, the Dutch will found the first of their overseas colonies, helping to fuel their economy even further. The Eighty Years' War is not over. The Twelve Years' Truce is just a truce. But it's over for the time being, and the result so far is a Protestant republic in what we now call the Netherlands and Spanish monarchy elsewhere in the land. So, why did the northern half of the Netherlands gain its independence while the south did not? There are a number of reasons, many of them military. In his book, A History of the Art of War in the 16th Century, British military historian Sir Charles Orman writes, quote, that the northern half of the old Burgundian heritage was destined to become a Protestant republic, and the southern half to remain a Spanish province down to the beginning of the 18th century, was to a large extent due to geographical causes. Belgium, to use a modern term, was for the most part a cavalry country, fit for great battles in the open, from Gembloor to Waterloo. The cockpit of Europe is a region that can be lost and won in the field, not so Holland, to again use a modern word, which is for the greater part of an extent so cut up by arms of the sea, rivers, canals, and marshes, that it is hard to find within its borders room to set up a large army and formal array. The fights that it has seen have been narrow-fronted scuffles along the tops of dikes, or desperate attempts to cross difficult water barriers. Its normal military history has been a long record of sieges of water-girt fortresses, rather than of general actions. The impossibility of deploying large armies for strategical maneuver in it was discovered alike by the Tercios of Philip II and the much-irritated battalions of Frederick, Duke of York, in 1799. Unquote. In addition to the military causes, it's also just factually true that the southern Netherlands, modern-day Belgium, were easier for the Spanish to resupply. When the French were friendly, they could freely move troops in and out of France, and even when the French were not, the southern Belgian ports were closer to Spain than the northern Dutch ports, which meant that they were easier to reach since you didn't have to sail for as long through sea beggar-infested waters. But let's also consider that there are cultural reasons. Because the Spanish initially controlled the South, they took it over fairly early in the war, and the rebels maintained control of the North for most of the war, populations shifted throughout this whole period, and this would have a snowball effect. Right? The more Catholics left the North and the more Protestants left the South the less chance there was to find common ground inside a given province. So instead, the northern provinces became ever more anti-Spanish, and the southern provinces became ever more wary of Protestant rule. 
Now, as I said, the 12 years truce is just a truce. The wars of religion in Europe are far from over in 1609, and the war between the Spanish and the Dutch isn't even fully settled. But the lines have been drawn for a new nation, with a new national identity and a new national hero. The nation of the United Provinces of the Netherlands. And that's why it's relevant. Guess who? It's me again, Dan. And I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description, and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but eh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.